basically, I'm interested in machine translation and the enormous advance that neural machine translation has made since late 2016. Uh, in case you don't know about it or haven't experienced it, I have a small demonstration here. This was the text from the uh, Zurich uh, conference uh, on uh, Friday morning, uh, which was asking a very interesting question. This is how Sistran uh, translated that about 10 years ago. Uh, I hope you will agree it was not readily usable, and it's at you know when you get to the stage of it is of course in the future to talk to that I can't even read it. Okay, uh, at that point any translator would get rid of the machine translation suggestion, translate from scratch. It's going to be more efficient and far more reliable. Okay, we could agree on that. Here though is what neural machine translation is doing with that same paragraph. It's not ideal. It's not perfect. If I were going to publish it, I would post-edit it, and I would deal with the minor points that are in red there, and I might even debate about keeping this language cultural thing, which might bring something new and useful into English, given that we have Sprachkulturelle over here as a wonderful Germanic invention. But hey, <laughs> If you're not using NMT, Neural Machine Translation, as a basis for your translations or language work, you might be missing out on a lot of efficiency. Uh, what we do find or found in statistical machine translation is that it's not always advantageous in terms of time on task, but there are real advantages, perhaps surprisingly, in terms of terminology. I'm interested in its social use. Now, this goal of usable, automatic machine translation was stated by Obama in 2009, the staff had come into office, as one of the things that could be achieved. And now, after 2016, I think we are there at a moment when that aim has come of age. Now it's no longer a yes we can, it's hey we have, and we have to come to terms with that. At the same time though, and this is where I apologize to the people who were there on Friday, yes we can put through Google Translate is of course Si Podemos. It's the name of a political party in Spain actually that, 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 that was born from Obama's enthusiasm and optimism. But if I back translate Si Podemos, on Google Translate, and I did it again today, it's still there, <coughs> if we can. Okay, what happened? It just left off the little accent on the top of the C, all right? But it's still there, it's still a mistake, it's still in the machine, we are still dealing with fallibilities. Now, some of these are quite funny. Uh, I have a 14-year-old son, who enjoys playing with it. And he's pointed me to websites of the funniest mistakes in Google Translate that you can find, or, or any machine translation system. The trouble is, I've been to all the websites now, and I've checked all the things. And of course, if it's there, then Google gets hold of it and repairs the mistake. They haven't repaired this one yet, happily. But here's one that might amuse you. If it doesn't, I'm stuck. OK, this is the Japanese ego, all right? which means, as you can see, return, and that's fine. But if we return, return, and write ego twice, it's regret. Wow, that's interesting. What's going on in Japanese? Write it again. <laughs> Embroidery. Echo production. I'm just repeating. Ego, ego, ego. Ego, ego. Eggplant deodorant. <laughs> isn't isn't <coughs> language wonderful? <laughs> Deliciousness of the C-squeeze trees. Oh, it's so poetic. <laughs> okay, and you just keep repeating. Just try it. Ego, 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 ego. And you get the most wonderful things. I stopped at this one, though. <laughs> Eastern <laughs> Airlines Transportation, whatever. <laughs> okay. Things are happening there that we don't know about. And it can be amusing. 
Uh, you get mistakes. The good thing about machine translation, we realized this back at the beginning of statistical MT, one of the good things is that when it's wrong, it's really wrong. And you can correct it. As opposed to translation memories, which give you fuzzy matches. Okay? And anything below 80% fuzzy match, you're doing a lot of cognitive work to find out where it's wrong. So just in terms of the ergonomics, or the cognitive economies of what you're doing, it's better to be really wrong than just a little bit wrong when the, you have to sort through the fuzzy matches. Now, I'm interested in that playful aspect of machine translation that my 14-year-old son has discovered, and his classmates, I must admit, and I'm interested in why it can be funny, why it can be amusing. Uh, I invite you to think about that. Okay, I'll get to an answer in about half an hour's time, but while I'm doing it, think about that. If it's amusing, perhaps you don't find it amusing. Why is it? What is it that, uh, that appeals to us or can appeal to certain kinds of people? All right. Now, I'm switching gears now. I, I have been getting lost down the pathways of the psychology of personality. I have a doctoral student working on the question, well, she's working on a set of questions, but one of them is, is there a translator personality? When people become translators, are they because they are certain kinds of people? And when people work as translators for a long time, does that change their personality? Okay. And so I've been looking at uh, research on this. I might add, uh, translation studies is in a field of, or a stage of handbooks at the moment. There are all these handbooks being written. I've counted 18 of them about various aspects of the <laughs> discipline. And for those of us unfortunate to have to write these things, although I accepted, I took on too many, but anyway, it's actually quite good. Now, not because translation studies has stable knowledge that can be packeted into handbooks, that's far from the case, and I'll show you, but because I've had to go back and read a lot of the early stuff. And in this case, early stuff on personalities, uh, and how tests were done to see what kind of people make good interpreters, what kind of people make good translators. And as I did this, I came across this psychological construct called tolerance of ambiguity. Are you thinking about why machine translation can be amusing? You start to see, oh, tolerance of ambiguity. What is this thing? And as I went into it, I saw that it's a concept developed after the end of the Second World War. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the basic tests come from Buddha, 1962. There is a later version applied to cross-cultural uh, relations. But this one is the one I was using because I was looking at the early research. And it concerns three things. Okay, tolerant. People can be tolerant of ambiguity or intolerant of ambiguity, and measures in between. One of the features that they're calling ambiguity is novelty. So here you are. It's like, you know, when you're waiting at the dentist and you get a magazine and you do these psychological tests. You can do this one. One to seven. I would like to live in a foreign country for a while. Yeah, I'll do that. I do all the time. I go back to Australia. It's not my country anymore. After 38 years outside, foreign country. Uh, what we are used to is always preferable to what is, yeah, seven. You're right? Personal regular adjective. Yeah, I agree with that. You agree? Yeah, we're, we're all very open to novelty so far. Okay, now I get to this one. Can you read that? Oh, I'm sorry. I like parties where I know most of the people rather than ones where all or most of the people are complete strangers. Actually, yes. But there's another question about parties with complete strangers. Not for me. I can, I can live... I, I've, I've lived in war zones. I'm fine with foreign countries and novelty. But parties with strangers, no. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, now, one of the problems is you're scored on this and your openness to novelty is presumed to be given by your answers to these questions. Whereas, for me at least, not all these questions are on the same level. Um, and if you're doing this kind of research, as with my doctoral student in this case, go back to the original questions and look at the questions that tell you something about the psychological trait you're trying to quantify. The second aspect of ambiguity here is it's called insolubility, but I googled that and that's, that means dissolving stuff in water. But that's what they've got in the test, so I'm following the psychologists. All right. They mean stuff that's hard, you know, problems for which there's no solution. Like in mathematics, mathematics, as you're probably aware, has the great unsolvable problems and people can come along and try to solve them. Do you want to do that or no? Sure, I'll go into that. Uh, an expert who doesn't have a yes or no answer, wrong. Uh, there's really no such thing as a problem that can't be solved. Yes, there are problems that can't be solved. Okay, so we can answer that. You're all doing well on tolerance to ambiguity, I should imagine. Okay. Can you see that again? Most of our important decisions are based on insufficient ins information. Oh, yeah, like getting married. <laughs> <laughs> Among other decisions. Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right. <laughs> At this point, I start to wonder why the psychologists call it ambiguity. If you think about these things that we're, that we're talking about. Anyway, the third one is complexity. And here, I've, Herman uh, did the uh, version of the questionnaire for cross-cultural relations, and he said would we'll take out some. So at, on this complexity, I've adopted his modifications of the 1962 model. People who fit their lives to a schedule probably miss most of the joy of living. Oh, I agreed. I don't know. In Switzerland, you probably... No, I'll leave that. You can, you can answer it however you like. <laughs> a good job is one where what is to be done and how it is to be done are always... Not for me. Mind you, teachers or supervisors who hand out vague assignments... <laughs> Give one a chance to show initi initiative and originality. None of my students would agree with that. I get all com these complaints, regular complaints, you didn't make the instructions clear. Oh, I'll let you show initiative and originality. Nope, I want them to. Okay. I think they're interesting questions, but I, I struggle to believe they're all pointing to the same psychological trait, even here. Uh, like with the one on novelty. However, those three things for the psychologists, for this tradition, and there's a lot of research behind it, come together uh, called tolerance of ambiguity. Was it novelty, insolubility, and complexity? And, and intellectually, we can see that those things sort of fit together. Okay? Why am I interested in this? Do you know about Gavagai? Should I tell you about Gavagai? Gavagai is a thought experiment um, invented by Willard van Orman Quine, a Harvard philosopher of language, in 19, we published first publication in 1959. Imagine a jungle linguist traveling out along the deepest archipelago. He writes beautifully. And he comes to a hitherto unknown tribe, first contact, and sits down and sets about describing the language. Where I am in Melbourne, people actually do this. People are out there describing it and sitting down with the natives, book in hand. Quine continues, a rabbit runs past. The native looks, points, and says... Gavagai. Linguist writes down, Gavagai equals rabbit. Equivalence. Translation. Knowledge. Now, Quine, in his work, sets about questioning that equivalence. How can we be sure that the native just said rabbit 
It could be, lo, a rabbit. It could be, my dinner is running away from me. <laughs> it could be, look, there's a flea on the left ear of that rabbit that just ran past. Or anything else. And so Quine sets up uh, in his thought experiment the series of questions one could ask in order to seek more certainty, to make that equivalence determinate. And he reaches the conclusion that for most kinds of knowledge, not all, most kinds of knowledge, translation is indeterminate. That is, we can never be sure if Gavagai equals rabbit. If only because we're never sure that the native is telling us the truth. And if you know anything about, well, certainly Australian Aboriginal languages and knowledge, there is knowledge that is reserved for people of the tribe and is not given to people outside. There's knowledge reserved for men and there's knowledge reserved for women. So the poor jungle linguist can write down anything he wants, conduct his linguistics, describe a language, but never get rid of the indeterminacy of translation. I'm, I'm going to talk about machine translation. <laughs> but, hey, think about it. What do we do when we use machine translation, when we use it badly? Now, tolerance of ambiguity could mean the capacity to live with indeterminacy. And I propose that what the psychologists are really talking about in terms of linguistic philosophy should be tolerance of indeterminacy. That is, the ability to live in an indeterminate world. That's, that's what these things sort of fit better than ambiguity, which in linguistics we know. It's, it's, it, it's a phrase that has two possible meanings, at least. But that's not obvious in what they've been calling ambiguity. So let me take that wealth of psychological knowledge and apply it to the theory of indeterminacy. Now, the psychologists find that tolerance of indeterminacy, people who score highly on that, correlates with openness to experience or being open-minded. These are two different tests. Being extroverted. I debated with Gary about whether or not this was a word. <laughs> Let's keep it indeterminate. <laughs> Self-efficacy, the ability to uh, predict one's uh, future performance. And negative correlations with bad things like Anxiety, perfectionism. I don't know, but perhaps that's not so bad in Switzerland. <laughs> okay, all right. So you can see where it's going. It, 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 it's talking about people who can do this sort of work well and people who will just get very frustrated with it. What's most interesting is that uh, high scores on uh, tolerance of ambiguity correlate well with language learning. They are found among people who speak many languages, and more importantly, they're a good predictor of who will be good at learning languages, which is interesting, because think about the way you learn a language. You're operating through constant hypothesis, looking for some confirmation, but never finding the whole confirmation, and it's this, this path through a world of constant novelty, Incredible complexity. Languages are nothing if not complex and often dealing with problems that we just can't solve and enjoying it and enjoying it for certain people. Okay. I, I've, I've picked up all this research again because of uh, Francois Grain who works in Geneva who has been publishing in the last few years the results of research where he claims, he's an economist, okay, but he claims that people who speak several languages are more creative. He further claims that the more languages you speak, the more creative you are. And he's using this research in order to justify the European unions. <coughs> We're not in Europe. No, that, the European unions multilingual regime. The argument is that by learning more languages, people become more creative 
and creativity and innovation are the motors of our economies, therefore give us more money for learning languages. Okay, that's a really, really good argument. But if it turns out that people with a certain psychological trait called tolerance of ambiguity or indeterminacy are the ones most likely to learn other languages, many, many more languages, then surely the correlation is not languages, creativity, but tolerance of ambiguity, languages, and a certain kind of creativity. That is, that there's something common to both. The other thing he didn't look at is parents' income, which I think helps a lot as well, for example. So I, I think there's, you know, in this, in this world of psychology and language, there's lots of tricky stuff going on. Uh, but this thing seems to help me think about a few of the debates that are occurring around us. 2017, this is a paper published uh, in one of the online journals in Australia. They've got groups here. I think there's about 16 to 20 uh, people in each group, so it's not a big research, but it's a nice thing to, to look at and, and, and be amused. We've got expert interpreters, expert translators, novice interpreters, novice translators, and we've run the test. It's only 16 questions. A test for tolerance of ambiguity. And we find that expert uh, interpreters have higher TA, it's, the A is missing, than novice interpreters. So that interpreters do better on tolerance of ambiguity. And what's more, the uh, correlation works for years of experience, but not for age, which suggests that the more people interpret the more they increase their tolerance of ambiguity. That is, the more they get used to solving problems of this indeterminate nature. Now, if you've ever done conference interpreting, but also community or dialogue interpreting, you'll know the truth of this. You manage to solve those problems on the spot, even though, as we said before, there's never, or the major decisions are never made on the basis of solid, uh, definitive data. Now, what worries me here is that they didn't find it for the translators. Of course, when, the pub, when you publish results, you say, oh, we found a significant increase for interpreters, headlines. And you go down and look at it, and what's even worse is the novice translators scored higher than the expert translators, if you look at the numbers. What happened? Why would translators, as opposed to interpreters, go down? Well, it's not significant, so we don't know. But why would they not go up significantly if interpreters do? Interesting, isn't it? Or perhaps not. Uh, that finding contradicts, and here's the early work that I found in my plowing through old publications for the handbook article, work by Fraser, take on a condit, okay who uh, looked at variables very much like the ones we've been considering and, and found that translators, the more expert the translator, the more they had of this. Not always. At that time, research on translation performance meant doing think aloud protocols. And you read through the papers and look, I don't want to, okay, these were very good pioneer researchers but it's really easy to go cherry-picking through the Think Aloud protocols, through what translators say as they speak, and forming an argument. And there is some interest in now confronting that with basically straightforward quantitative psychological research. Not to say one is true or the other is true, but certainly to cast doubt on the previous methods that found what they wanted to find. I'm not going to go here too much. I just want to say that there are several tests, and the test I've been using with my doctoral student is a neo-personality test. It's a different one, but it has questions and values that are 
rather similar if you look at them, although the titles are worrying, okay? But you can see they're getting at much the same thing. Uh, complexity is imagination. Uh, you can, you know, these different psychological tests are doing different things, but if you go back to the actual questions, you will find some that are getting at the same preference that people would have. Okay, now, in the research that we've been doing, we have a psychological trait combining those things that you saw on the right-hand side called openness to experience. And we find that in our group, which has only 16 people in it, so it's not huge, we find that the more experience they have, not age, but experience, the less open to experience they are. And if it happens with years of professional experience and not age, then it's not just a fact of you're getting older. It's a fact of, hey, the more professional you are, the less you're becoming open to experience. At, at the same time, we look at the, their risk management strategies, and this is based on characterizing the choices they make and think aloud protocols we find that the more experienced translators take more risks, which I think is great. And I'm looking at this data, and I'm thinking back of the previous one, I say, how could a professional translator become less open to experience and yet take more risks? and yet apparently not increase in tolerance of ambiguity. Oh, and this has been a problem. And in my adventures through old research, I came across Jensen, 2001, a doctoral thesis defended in Copenhagen, um, which some of you might know about where she looked at think aloud protocol data and she had two models. Uh, these are actually models drawn from the psychology of writing. Now you know when you have to write something, often if it's a creative essay or I don't know, if you've got time especially, you start writing and as you write the thing develops. That writing is a way of producing your knowledge. Okay, you don't know where you're going to go, but as I write, I'm going to put it together, and it's going to make sense sooner or later. Believe me, everything I've written is always like that. It happens on the page. Why? Because writing is a dialogue with oneself. And it's quite an effective way of producing stuff. On the other hand, if I have to write the minutes of a meeting, or I just did a doctoral defense in France, and I had to write a report, memory, and there I used a knowledge-telling model. Here's what it is, and... There it is. And I'm going to give, I'm going to tell you the knowledge that I've got. So these two models of writing were knowledge producing versus knowledge telling. <coughs> now, everyone who ever did Scopos theory or adapting text to a new audience or making it fresh and exciting, everyone would want translators to use a knowledge producing strategy or knowledge transforming strategy. And yet Jensen found in her data very, very clearly that, not, that translators, professional translators, were using experts for her, the knowledge telling model. There it is, telling you what it is. No trouble. Less problem solving, goal setting, and reanalyzing behavior than the younger translators. Well, I could believe that because novice translators tend to find everything problematic and want to find a source or a reference for everything. They're, they're going to Google everything in the text and they never get it finished. Okay? Whereas professionals, we know, tend to rely on their own interiorized encyclopedic knowledge and are prepared to wing it. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but, but come on, if you're a professional translator, just between us, in the kitchen, <coughs> we don't, we're not sure of everything. Okay, this, this model seems to explain my problem. 
How is it that the more experienced translators can take risks? I know that because... And be less open to experience. Why? Because they have to go fast. Because they're going to find a problem, pick a solution, and put the solution there, and tell you what it was, and I'm not going to think about it, because if I thought about it, I'd never get it finished, and I'd never get paid correctly. Okay? And this seems to be a model that accounts for what I'm seeing. Now, the problem is that I've got translators in two worlds now. I've got translators as these people who learn languages and increase their tolerance of indeterminacy and enjoy doing all that. And now I've got translators as these people who, here it is, here it is, here it is, who, who just adopt this completely alternative attitude to language. Okay, so we're readers and we're writers, but we are that in the same person. Catford, old stuff, old, old, old translation theory, 1965. Catford was writing in the same years as Quine. So whereas Quine had the linguist asking questions, his linguist actually gets married into the tribe and lives there forever, trying to find out what Gavagai means. <laughs> Catford's not going to marry into a tribe or anything. He's going to say, ah, oh, the authority of a competent bilingual informant or translator. That translators learn to play the role of authority. And that in my own theory, indeterminism stops when there is a social authority to stop the questioning. Now, the authority can be your employer, it can be an official glossary, it can be the client sending you a translation memory, it can be any number of things, or it can be translators pretending to be sure when they're not, as some of us are wont to do. But the translators are condemned to playing this double game. The translator, in the end, authorizes the translation. And our role with machine translation is going to be that. The machine can produce something. There might be two or th three errors per page. We can spot them and correct them, but more importantly, we're going to say, it's right. We're going to authorize it, like a notary does. What does a notary do? Give a trustworthy signature and a stamp. A future of one part of the translation profession will be that, to be the authority and to play that authoritative role. You can see it does make sense, you see? It comes together. Where did tolerance of ambiguity come from? You go back to the 50s, 1950s, the authoritarian personality, one of the foundational texts of the psychology of personality. T.W. Adorno, Theodore Adorno, Elsa Franco Wunschik are trying to explain to the world how Nazis came to power and how they were accepted and what is it in the Nazi personality that produces this. This is why Elsa was particularly interested in tolerance of ambiguity because she found the authoritarian personality to have almost zero tolerance of ambiguity. And it was a political struggle. This was founded by the American Jewish Association trying to understand what had happened in the Second World War. The psychologists don't want to talk about that anymore because they've made it into a construct used for telling us how to run businesses and employ people, but politics are never far from the issue. For Franco Brunswick, who is very aware that what we do with language is full of emotions, this thing has come back later, but it was certainly there at the time. She found that the people who had low intolerance of ambiguity also had very marked emotional ambivalence. Okay, she was Freudian, and it's ambivalence towards their parents and the other sex. But the 
image is this, that there are people who are very unsure of where they are in social relations and retreat from that to the acceptance of fixed values. That is, they don't want to see that ambiguity which is in live, actual, changing social relations with close people. So we find that the authoritative, authoritarian personality will pick up uh, religion and uh, fixed values and applied in a dogmatic way okay, to cover over their inner emotional ambivalence, like a classical format for, for that period in, in psychology. However, when I look at my translators who are working with indeterminate problems but then assuming an authoritative role, I say, wait a minute. Perhaps that does help us explain what's going on. It's pointed out in this work that people with very low, well, very high tolerance of ambiguity never make decisions and become ineffectual, okay, and that most people are in between, and that, that, that it's good to avoid the extremes here. It's interesting that in translators we might have these two things being played off against each other. Now, my background is in sociology. I read psychology and all this stuff at arm's length. That's interesting. Okay, tell me about it. But look, just foundationally, I do not believe that the human subject is constituted as a psychological reality before communication. It's in Lacan. And that look, communication is fundamentally social. What we are and how we act has always been formed in relation with others. This is my primacy of sociology, if you will. Okay. And it is of some interest to consider these attitudes in a wider social context. Now, you might know that sociologists like Beck and Giddens have described our contemporary societies as risk societies. Why is it risk society? Well, indeterminism. Indeterminism expressed as a lack of one-directional, univocal relations between cause and effect. There is an idealization of a previous age when, according to the sociologists, we actually trusted professionals to take care of cause and effect. We trusted doctors. Do we? Bankers. See, Switzerland, you probably still do. Australia's just been through this huge banking scandal where we just realized the banks have been robbing us for the past 20 years. Okay, all the trust in banks has disappeared. What do you got? Lawyers? Would you trust? Politicians? You guys in Switzerland probably do trust people. Okay, you're an exception to the rule. Okay. But we go through it. Scientists, electricity companies, they're ripping us off in Australia as well. Hey, and translators. In a society of trust, the professional intermediaries, the liberal professions as we have it, would be trusted and translators would be trusted. However, complexity is such that the indeterminacy between cause and effect is breaking down trust in these professions and it's interesting to consider the extent to which that affects our professions in a broader sense, translators, interpreters, and the whole lot. People have less and less reason to trust us. They don't believe our concoction of authority. Why? Because they can get back to the indeterminate data on which our authority is based. Do you ever go to the doctor and then Google what they say to you? Or, more likely, before you go, you go, oh, I think I've got this, and you go and look at all that, oh, you feel really sick, okay, <laughs> when you read all these, oh, I've got that one, I've got that one too, oh, no, all right. And, and, and then you go to the doctor, really just so the doctor can tell you, no, it's not any of that other stuff, okay. But, but are we going to trust them? Not like before, not like before when they had all the scientific information and it wasn't immediately available. 
The same thing happens with translators. The same thing. Not all the time and not everywhere. This is a, a book, uh, a special issue of a journal, 2018, that we did on mediation strategies. Uh, this is a European project run by Francois Grand, who I should not have criticized, I just realized. However, uh, and I was in charge of the part of that project that looked at the use of interpreters, machine translation, intercomprehension, and lingua francas in solving multilingual problems, particularly the situations of asylum seekers and recent immigrants, but also Erasmus exchange programs, the Russian-speaking community in Catalonia, uh, international adoption. We have a series of case studies that we looked at to see how people actually solve multilingual problems. That is, problems where they don't speak all the languages that are there. Okay. Now, very typically, the use of machine translation is to check on what's going to happen before you go to the doctor, also to check on the laws, and also to check on your interpreters. That is, many of the immigrants, perhaps because they come from countries where authority is more corrupt than it is here, see the translator and the interpreter more or less as a spy or as an enemy, not to be trusted, and use the technologies, use the machine translations to check on them, perhaps to build up trust in some of them, but often because there is a lack of trust in some of them. They prefer very definitely to do it themselves with machine translation than to use professional interpreters, basically because of a lack of trust. Do they enjoy the machine translation? Ah, that's going a long way. Okay, but there is in this social use of translation, beyond the professionals, there is this ability to tap in to the indulgence of indeterminism, this exploring of what can happen, the wonderful things that can happen in language without having to retreat into the moment of authority, this pretense of certitude that translators have professionally been trained to use. For me, the big contribution that machine translation, neural machine translation, makes to our day and age is that everybody has access to it and can use it. And can use it for fun. Not to get determinate information, but to continue and explore the world. On Friday, many people were talking about Deepol, perhaps because it's German-owned and we don't like to trust American companies. But Deepol does have this wonderful capacity. You don't like what the translation is for selbstverständlich, self-evident, click, and you get all these alternatives. It's wonderfully indeterminate, and it's up to you to decide which one you want to go with. You click on one, it'll adjust the sentence accordingly, and you can go on and experiment with that as much as you want. Some people enjoy that. People who enjoy all those features of novelty, complexity, and problems that are hard to solve, hard to solve, should enjoy interacting with technologies that are presented in this way. The only danger is that machine translation is presented in an authoritative way, as the translation. That is the one way in which it shouldn't be used. That's the way in which professional translators should be used. For the rest, let the world play with it and enjoy it. Thank you for your attention.